hour short drive. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, uh, my mind is kind of affected all around the teach George, but <laughs> you know, you can always tell a fighter pilot, but you can't tell him much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't say that because uh, he's going to help me get through this presentation. The story that I'm going to tell you is about Moscow's Mill historic site. And you may ask, where is it? Well, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Oh. Oh, yes. If you look here, this is, this is Spartan District. And Cowpens is up there. The city of Spartanburg will be built right here on Lawson's Fort. This is the Pacolet River. This is the Tiger River and Black Sox. And this is the Henry. In those days, as today, it is the southern border of Spartanburg County. And Musgrove's Mill is right there on the Ennery River. Now, the first people who came to the Ennery <coughs> were hunters because deer were plentiful and deer hides were very profitable. And um, they did extremely well. Okay, George. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The book, the maps as usual are by uh, John Robertson, you know John, and uh, Dwight Ellisor. Why can't I advance it? Chris, turn off your green light. Lisa. Okay. They also found a lot of a bear there, and they could shoot in a season enough bear to provide two to three thousand pounds of bear bacon. I have a friend who lived in the North Carolina mountains during the Depression, and he tells me it's not only very good, it's very nutritious, and I will take his word for it. <laughs> now, next, George. Right side. When the uh, first settlers came there, they found it was a very, very fertile area. And they soon cleared it and started to grow corn and wheat and indigo. And they did very well there because along the Ennery, there were several fords where they could uh, cross the river. And the Cherokee Trail also went across the river there. So they did have some means of transportation. Until the Indian attacks. And then most people, as you know, left the back country and came down where it was safer. However, some stayed. George? And there were a few stockaded forts. Two of them were on this area of the Ennery and those people survived. Now, <clears throat> after the Indian attacks were over, people flocked into the areas of the Ennery and the Tiger Rivers. Next one. And Edward Musgrove acquired 450 acres right here. This is the road that goes across the ford, which became Musgrove's Ford. And uh, this is the old Cherokee Trail, which would extend down through here. Next. And he built, because there were shoals there, an undershot mill. And he became a very profitable miller. Now, when the Revolutionary War came, the whole back country exploded in violence because 96 was a post for British soldiers and it was just 30 miles south of Musgrove's Mill. 
And you had a series of battles um, starting the 12th of uh, July. Uh, Cedar Springs, Earl's Fort, Fort Thickety, Fort Prince, Alfred's, uh, Walford's Ironworks, and they all set the stage for an ambitious attack at Musgrove's Mill. Now, in these skirmishes, the British provincials took a beating, and there were a tremendous number of casualties. So the British set up a hospital at Musgrove's Mill, and the Patriots decided that they would attack. The Patriot commanders were Elijah Clark and Isaac Shelby at first. Now, those two commanders had inflicted most of those casualties. And they were determined to go down and take out the rest of them. Now, they were joined by James Williams uh, of the Little River Militia. And you'll hear a lot more about James Williams tomorrow because Will Graves will be here to tell you about him. Now, it was real advantage to have James Williams there because he was a local and his people knew the area. Further, the Little River Militia came from south of the Ennery, between the Ennery and 96. James Williams' plantation was 15 miles from 96, and the British had taken it as a headquarters for Patrick Ferguson, and Williams' family was under house arrest. So he joined this group. They intended to uh, travel 40 miles at night, and this is August the 18th, so it would be a little warm. Next, George. And they expected at that site to find the hospitalized provincials just protected by one group of loyalist militia under a local whose name was Daniel Clary. Now, after traveling their 40 miles and getting there very early in the morning, um, a Tory patrol uh, detected them. So the element of surprise was out. But they were also told by locals that the night before, British troops had moved from 96 and had camped at Musgrove's Mill. Now those troops we now know were headed to join Lord Cornwallis, who was over in this part of the country. But they were there, and their mounted were down lower on the river, protecting other fords. And now, Next. This is what they were faced with, and this is from Pat O'Kelly. Um, more Loyalist militia, and the Royalists, the New Jersey Volunteers, the Lancers Volunteers, those are all provincial soldiers. They are trained, equipped, and paid by the British. They had fought in New England and in the Middle States. They had fought at Savannah and at Charleston. They were a disciplined, experienced bunch. And then O'Kelly has 300 from uh, David Cleary. Now Brian Robeson, who's the historian at, and the uh, site manager at Musgrove's Mill, uh, says that that number is too high for Cleary. So it would be fewer than 600. But there were only roughly 200 patriots. And now they're faced overwhelming odds with experienced so, uh, soldiers. Now what to do? Well, their horses were exhausted and they had come to fight and fight they would. And they dug in on a ridge overlooking uh, a cleared field, uh, quite a distance from the river. Now, how were they going to get the British into that field? They sent a Georgian by the name of Shadrick Inman with about 18 riders forward to attack the British, withdraw, attack and withdraw, and lure the British within rifle range. And it worked. And eventually, the British moved and displayed in the field below the ridge. And they attacked. Now the Patriots were firing at officers 
and NCOs. And they, when they first fired, um, devastating loss on the British, but they were trained to step over their fallen and keep going. And they did, and tried to attack uh, the line with bayonets. And they put heavy, more heavy fire. Now, in that confrontation, all of the British and Loyalist officers on the field, with the exception of one, have been killed or wounded. And when their uh, commander, uh, Colonel Ennis, fell to the ground with a bullet through his neck, the cry came up from the Patriots, we've killed their commander, and the British had had enough. And they turned and they fled down toward the river. Now, the Patriots came after them and fired into the backs of the retreating British. And this is the kind of casualties that they inflicted. 63 killed, 90 wounded, 70 captured. And of the Patriots, four killed, sadly, <coughs> one was shattered. Inman. Now, the British splashed across the, the river and right through their camp, many of them started right down the road to 96. And the Patriots were determined to follow, but they needed their horses. So they stopped at the river's edge to wait till they brought up the horses which had been tethered behind the Patriot line. And while they were there, a courier arrived and told them that General Gates had been defeated at Camden. The Continental Army was gone. They had no protection. This group was behind enemy lines and that they should flee to safety. So they took their prisoners and they did. But before they left, they made an agreement that would impact on the way the rest of the war in the back country was fought. Shelby envisioned an army of militia. And Clark and Williams agreed. See, here we had South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia militia under three different commanders inflicting that kind of damage on the British. And they saw that was a good idea, so they agreed that they'd keep in touch, and if one were threatened, they would all come and they would mass the militia to deal with the British. And this strategy would set the stage for what happened next. When Shelby was threatened by Patrick Ferguson, he assembled a militia from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, and surrounded um, Patrick Ferguson at Kings Mountain, and of course he was killed there, and unfortunately, uh, Colonel William, uh, James Williams was also. And at Blackstock's, when Sumter defeated uh, Tarleton, he was joined by two groups of Georgia militia, one under Colonel Clark and the other under <coughs> Colonel Twiggs. And then at Cowpens, you had, again, militia from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So the strategy at Prophet's Coast Mill was working. Now, what happened along the river? Were they safe now? Certainly not, because as people moved from 96, the soldiers from 96, militia moving back and forth across that river, all of the inhabitants were in danger when the enemy came through. So it was not a comfortable or safe place to live. Now, eventually, the war moved over in this area. But in the spring, Nathaniel Greenhill came back and he sieged 96. So when supply wagons were moving south to reach Green across the Tigris and the Tiger and the Edward Rivers. And when Green withdrew from 96, he moved his Continental Army back across the Ellery before he moved to the east across Broad River. And then, of course, he eventually ended up right up here at the Hot Hills of Santee. And eventually we get to Utah Springs and Yorktown. And maybe the people thought they were safe, but they were not. 
because bloody Bill Cunningham went on his rampage in about a month after uh, Yorktown, and he started at Clouds Creek on the Saluda River and burned homes, killed patriots, slaughtered prisoners. He moved then to the Ennery and then to the Tiger before he was finally stopped. Well, eventually the war was over. And what <coughs> happened to these battlefields? Well, nothing. Nobody built any monuments. Um, they didn't have the graves <coughs> like they did later. Um, the people were desperate to get on with their lives. And most of them were desperately poor in the back country. A few people who had slaves and large holdings, or who had a trade, like Edward Musgrove, um, were able to survive. But a traveler in the 96th district said there were 1,200 <coughs> rivers there, and that would include the Ellery and the Tiger River. And it was 50 years before Congress gave any relief to that militia. Now, there had been pensions for uh, Continentals, but it was 50 years before the people in the back country, who had all been militia mostly, um, got any relief. And in order to get the pension, you had to appear, record, describe under oath the service for which the pension was claimed. And Pension applications on, uh, online, it's a place that you can spend days. Thanks to Charles Baxley and Scar and Will Graves, who has done tireless work on this. Now, in the book, I put a chapter on the voices from uh, Musgrove's Mill. And these were accounts of people who were there. And they, um, they told about what they had done 50 years after the fact, and they knew that that battle had been important. They knew that they had contributed to the American victory, and the, victor uh, the historians may have forgotten, but they remembered, and those accounts are extremely interesting. Now, Musgrove's Mill, as well as other sites, were rapidly being neglected. Uh, very few people knew about them and uh, were getting on with their lives. And there were a few uh, mentions in print. And the first was William Pendleton uh, Kennedy. And this is historic fiction, um, Horseshoe Robinson, and it's a story of the back country. Uh, one of his uh, heroines is Mary Musgrove, the daughter of the miller on the Henry River. And uh, she is a great patriot. And he does uh, refer to the battle at Musgrove's Mill and then uh, leading up to the Battle of Cakes Mountain. And there's a lot of very good information in there, but you can't tell what is fiction and what is history. It's still a very interesting read. But John Logan was a serious historian, and he intended to write a series of books under this heading, um, History of the Upper Country of South Carolina. And as a very young man, he had walked King's Mountain with his grandfather who had fought there. Among his neighbors were many veterans of King's Mountain, Musgrove's Mill, Calvin's, and he interviewed those men over a, over a lifetime. And he published the first book, and all it covered the early Indian tribes in the back country and the colonial period. And he never got to the revolution in spite of the fact that he had a tremendous amount of material on it. That material fell in the hands of Draper, Lyman Draper. And if you read King's Mountain, 
you know there's a lot of material in that book about Musgrove smell. Uh, most of it, is, or a good bit of it, is taken from Logan's notes. Now, some of the notes Draper acknowledges. Some of the material that he took from uh, Logan, uh, he did not. I think that's sturdy pool, but that's the way he did it. Now, all of the anecdotes about the Battle of Musgrove's Mill that are from Draper are from Logan's notes. And it's a shame that Logan never wrote that book because he was a, a wonderful writer, but he knew the territory, he knew the graveyards, he knew the families, he knew the fords, the fords and the rivers and the trails. And uh, it was it's rather tragic. Now the next person, and it's Draper published in 1881. Um, can you go back one, George? The next one uh, was was uh, Landrum. And Landrum, according to his preface, uh, intended to write a book about all of these backcountry incidents, put them in chronological order and in perspective. And he lamented the fact that many primary sources were being lost. I mean, this was the end of the 1800s, he's worried about this. And <clears throat> many of the accounts that had been published were out of print and before it was all gone he wanted to gather the whole thing together and he wrote a wonderful book it is a gem um, <clears throat> and, it, and reprints are available today although it was very quickly out of print um, and so if you've got a hundred or 150 dollars handy uh, you might want to invest in that but it is a gem considering the time that it was it was uh, uh, written. And he does a wonderful job of putting all of these together and showing how that they are related. But it didn't last long. It was soon out of print. Now, many of you here today are writers, and you know how important a title is. And George, next. This is his title. <laughs> There's nothing there to show that this is really a gem <clears throat> describing the backcountry events of the Revolutionary War. Now, it would be a hundred years before serious historians would get much attention for the Southern Campaign. And that book, first book, was Henry Lumpkin, 1981, from Savannah to Yorktown, the American Revolution in the South. Now, Lumpkin was a professor at the University of South Carolina, and I am told that he was quite eccentric. Uh, a few people from USC are laughing, at least for one. Uh, but he had an international reputation, not as a war historian, but as a military historian. And some of you may remember his series on Greek fire and the Greek fleets and the Trojan Wars and the like. But he was internationally respected. And when he wrote that all of these backcountry militia engagements, including Musgrove's Mill, led up to King's Mountain, the first major step in the two-year campaign that led Cornwallis to Cornwallis' surrender at Yorktown and the final expulsion of the British from Georgia and the Carolinas. And so in front of God and everybody, Lumpkin is saying, this is important. But there's one problem with that book. With the exception of a few direct quotes, which he acknowledged, it is a narrative account and there are no citations. Enough to drive you crazy. However, John Buchanan's book of 19, in 1997, The Road to Guilford Courthouse would correct that. 
Uh, Mr. Buchanan is here and he's going to speak tomorrow about uh, Francis Marion. But this is the book in which he uses biographical information on the major characters, uh, background information on sites and incidents. And to give you an example, um, citations abound. Lumpkin wrote 330 pages to cover the whole Southern campaign, and Buchanan wrote 450 pages that he only got to Guilford Courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> and after two chapters on these backcountry um, engagements in his book, and after a very thorough account of Muscrow's Mill, he writes this. Gates may have lost most of his army, but they, the militia, had won the fight, and they were not prepared to surrender the back country to the king's inspector of militia, Major Patrick Ferguson. Now, the next year, Georgia, South Carolina, Parks and Recreation published this book, and Musgrove's Mill is not mentioned in spite of the fact that the state of South Carolina had owned the property for 30, for 20 some years. Next. 1975, the, tour, the Parks Recreation and Tourism bought the 330 acres of Musgrove Track. Now, they were bullied into doing it by another eccentric, a politician whose name was Sam Manning uh, from the Spartan District. He also was instrumental in getting cow pens uh, recognized, and he tried to get people interested in Utah Springs. That didn't work, as you know. But when this, material, this uh, property was for sale, he harangued the legislature, and they bought it but they didn't appropriate any money to improve it. Uh, in fact, I don't think they had a foggy notion what it was all about. And so 20 years after, it's not marked. And everybody thought that that 330 acres covered all of the battlefield. The area to the south of the river where the mill was, and the Musgrove's home was, and the, and the acreage north of the river where the battle had been fought. And it is out in the middle of nowhere, and the locals used it. The Boy Scouts camped there. Phil Adair probably went out there camping with his black powder uh, weapon, and nobody was challenged, so they assumed the state owned it all. But in 1997, George Fields retired. He has, uh, was very active in the uh, um, Palmetto Conservation Foundation, and he retired.